So I promised you this afternoon, this final session was how some of this is now woven together into real projects and into the reality of what we're facing. And you're gonna hear from some extraordinary speakers. Um, but without further ado, um, I'm gonna welcome uh, James Allen, uh, who uh, to my, just behind me here, who very, very kindly, very bravely agreed to step in to chair this panel, because those of you who are very beady-eyed will notice that the program says Alexa Furmanish, uh, who I have never known a better prepared chair for a session than Alexa. Uh, she was with us on Tuesday, very sadly yesterday, she, she uh, was getting iller and iller, and I think quite rightly made the call that she had to look after her health. And so just take a moment to thank Alexa for all the work she's done to bring this group together. But then, without any further ado, James Allen is the most accomplished moderator, facilitator. He has an extraordinary organization called OLAB that some of you may have worked with. So I know we're in incredibly, incredibly safe hands to, uh, to pick this up. And so please welcome James, and then James will introduce this fabulous panel. So thank you all. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a real privilege to be up here for the final session uh, and to have come from such an incredible lunch and engagement with you all. I don't think we've had a chance yet to talk about the food at this conference. There's been so many wonderful aspects to it, including the artwork. But just to say, and isn't it nice to come back from lunch and sort of still feel energized? Um, so thank you to the organizers for the food, yeah. Um, so, my name's James. Thanks for the introduction, Justin. I work as a mediator and facilitator on food, forests, and land use, mainly in Brazil. Uh, and I wanted to honor Alexa as well, so thanks for saying that, Justin, but she's done some incredible preparations. So, um, Alexa, if you're listening to this, thank you so much, and I'll try and do justice to all the preparation that you've done. Um, this is our final session, and it's kind of our session as we go out into the world, right, as individuals that have uh, roles and jobs and activities and we're kind of about to say that step into action uh, and we've been talking as a panel about what this this panel is about and one of the panelists came up to me and he said look we're not the academic panel we're working in the real world so I think one of the things that we're trying to do here is really bring to life a lot of what we talked about over the last three days and show what it looks like in the real world out there through a number of really exciting examples um, we have on the stage uh, a wonderful artist, Jane Frary. Uh, Jane has produced a number of artworks, including one at the very entrance here to the session, The Falls of Caledon. And The Falls of Caledon, we'll talk a little bit about it um, in my introduction, but it's these beautiful waterfalls, Scottish waterfalls that you see at the entrance. And it talks a little bit about uh, long time. So the idea that the waterfalls have been there way before all the beasts and animals were there but it also talks about short time and the time that's in front of us as we move forward. And I wanted to invite us to think a little bit as we leave here about those sort of two horizons into the future. I think this panel is going to sort of bring ideas around the new horizons that are emerging when we think about uh, nature-based economies and well-being economies. It's also an invitation for us to think very immediately about what it is that each one of us wants to do and to act in that world out there. So let me talk a little bit just briefly about how we're going to get organized here. Um, we have a wonderful array of panelists that have all in different ways restored relationships with nature based solutions. So we've got we've got relationships at the heart of what we're going to be discussing here today. Um, they've restored relationships with with nature based solutions in a number of ways through we're going to start exploring restoration and regeneration projects. We're going to move on to a fantastic example of a, juris, a, a jurisprudence-based project, so a legal project. And then we're going to look at uh, the much more uh, intangible parts of change and of relationships, which is art and what drives us as human beings as well. Um, there is a, traditionally in theatre, there's a fourth wall here, right? So we're sort of divided. So you guys are out there and we're up here. And I think for this session, we'd like to sort of break down that fourth wall and kind of all, all, all be, all see ourselves both as sort of actors in this space, but also the ones that can ask questions. So sort of questions can go both ways here as well and answers can go both ways as well. 
Um, and in, in, insofar as I think that's the case, I'm going to be asking the panelists about how they can restore relationships with nature, but I'm going to be asking you to say the same questions yourselves. How can I restore relationship? How can I restore relationship with nature? How can I restore relationship with my community, with the land? How can I restore relationship with myself? Okay, so just before we introduce the panel, um, I wanted us to explore our relationship with a very particular nature-based solution, which is rain. And I have both Brazilian and British uh, nationality. My, the British bit of me has a very ambiguous relationship with rain, right? We love to, as Brits, complain about the rain, talk about the rain, question the rain, charm at the rain. Um, but the rain, of course, is a really important part of our culture as well. It kind of when you come to England from abroad, the green is that sort of translucent, vibrant green that we see. And of course, that comes from the rain. The rain is a really important part of our culture. You know, I think about fashion. I think about Macintoshes and Wellington boots and umbrellas. Uh, I think about art and poetry and music in which rain appears as well. And I think about the speed that a football hits the football pitch when it's been raining. So it's really integral to, 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 to being in England and talking about England as well. Um, what we don't talk about so much is the sound of the rain. So I wanted to do a little exercise with us here, which actually comes from Brazil. But we're going to make the sound of the rain in the room, right? And we're going to do this all together. We're going to make raindrops with just one finger. And we can make a heavier rain. Okay, and it can go quieter again. And now I'm just going to invite us to shut our eyes as we do this and listen to the rain, and it may grow, it may move away as well. So just let's explore it together with our eyes shut, this rain that's in the room. Okay, welcome back. So our wonderful panelists, thank you for accepting the invitation to be up here today. Uh, our story goes from large scale restoration and regeneration. Tino, Florent uh, and Suzanne. Tino and Florent speaking from experience from the Andes, Suzanne from New Zealand. We move on to the case of global jurisprudence with Jojo and I'll introduce each speaker with a little bit more detail as they come up the role of art and imagination with Jane, and then a connection with the personal through regeneration and restoration with Alan. Tino and Florent, over to you. You both work at Axion Andina, an organization that you both co-founded and a large scale community led restoration initiative in the high Andean forest ecosystems. You were your organization was awarded the Earthshot Prize this year, so I know that's been a really important part of your journey and we'd love to hear more about that. The microphone will come on um, in a second. Uh, Constantino, I know you're a native conservation leader. You're a biologist from the high Andes. You're currently president of ECOAN, Asociación de Ecosistemas Andinos, and you've been recognized by the UN as champion of the earth. Florent, you're a conservation entrepreneur and CEO of Global Forest Generation and you've been involved in more than 200 forest and land use projects as well. So I think what we wanted to explore with, with what you have to share, I think first through you, Tino, is a little bit around what local community, community leadership looks like, how you've connected that with deep ancestral culture in the highlands, 
and how that's achieved success for your organization and for the leaders of the organization. And Florian, I know you have a bit of a, a global perspective on the work as well, but I know that you've come in and recognized that um, uh, local communities were very sc scarcely involved in the project initially. And what you've, what you've aimed to do is work really closely with humans on the ground to, so to bring in the really human and leadership element as well. So we'd love to hear from you about what you've learned from that experience as well. So please join me in welcoming Tino and Florent. Thank you so much for inviting us to talk about our reality. I represent Action Andina. Action Andina is a movement that is planting native trees along all the Andes, more than 7,000 kilometers of mountains in South America. How we are doing this? Of course, we are doing this with Quichuas, Quechuas, Aymaras, Collas, Patagonians, Muleros, Gauchos, all of them united on planting trees, native trees. In the year 880, happens a huge climate change in South America that kills most of the pre-Inca cultures. The remainings of that cultures climbs up of the mountains, but the, for what? Not to cry, not to, to sit down and started to say, let's uh, adapt to the climate change. No, they climb up and they use the positive resilience. What does mean that? For water, they build canals and reservoirs and aqueducts. For agriculture, terraces or andenes. For the weather, they did a massive restoration all based on what? Working all together for a common goal that is called the communal work or Aini or Minga. These guys was sometimes part of the Inca culture. But what happens now, they are coming to try to demand for what? Respect. All the native and local communities, they demand for respect, talk, being listened, and if it's possible, share knowledge. In that way, Action Andina used all this ancient uh, knowledge that works thousand years ago and still now, if you visit Cusco, you are going to see all these things working. And in that way, we already on the last five years, we planted 10 million trees. But for the youth, even for my kids, that is nothing yet. Why? Many times I ask them, 10, 10 million trees is nothing. I created more than 16 national parks in Peru, but it's not nothing. They say, no, we need more. Of course, I understand that the youth is not going to be like us, yes, all people, yes, uh, trying to pass to the other side. And we needed to try to, for, to listen to them. They are demanding for a green and healthy planet. They, are, they don't want to be on the future living in the death rock. For that reason, we answer to the local communities when they demand for all that, uh, they respect everything, they said, okay, what do you want? And they said, we want to be part of the solution. Okay, and what does it mean that? Okay, training, jobs, and also leadership. Not just, when we arrive as uh, like Action Andina, what happens in all the Andes? Most of the people were so shy, afraid. Why? Because all the time the people have been telling them that that is not going to work. That is impossible. Never is going to work that. And for us, it was difficult to start this massive program. But from the beginning, say, please believe. If you are not going to do it that, you are not going to succeed. We can just wait one year, two years, but the third year you must become expert. And that is happening right now. One example, in Argentina, in 20 years, they planted 20,000 trees in 20 years. When we appear as Action Andina, we say, no, 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 sorry, that is not the way. Okay, you must to plant over 50,000 trees. They say, no, no, that is not possible. Now they are planting more than a half million trees. This is the opportunity. Okay. Here comes the other thing. The local 
and native communities, every time, comes and knock all doors to try to be part of this program. They want to be united. There is no a problem of frontiers. All together for one tree, polylepis tree, the highest forest in the world. Some of them grows above 5,000 meters sea level. But what does do it, this forest? Secure water. Helps on the climate change and also helps for the biodiversity. Last week I've been in Brazil. Everybody just desperate on saving the Amazonian. I say, sorry, sorry. You know that the water comes from the mountains, eh? You must to think first on the mountains and they've been thinking on the, in the lowlands. If you're not going to save all these mountains that supposedly in 2050 is going to disappear, all these glaciers, 70% of them, is going to happen something, greenhouse. All your clouds that you're producing in the Atlantic part are not going to be frozen and coming down, becoming a rain. You know, for all those reasons, I want to finish my interview telling you that the conservation without money is just conversation. But if this didn't include the local communities, it's bad conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, everybody, and thank you for this wonderful uh, uh, day today. We, we arrived late, so this is our first day. But before I start deep diving a bit deeper in some of the aspects Tino mentioned, there's something that has been bothering me probably for years, and I feel right now is the opportunity to say it. And that's based on the conversation we had throughout the entire day, the concept of nature-based solution. Of more specifically, the word itself. It sends me on an intellectual walk, twice, three times across the earth until I let it sink in. Nature-based solution. I feel that it's the most Western technocratic term that has ever been invented for the type of work that we are doing. And so I would want us, why don't we call it nature? Or mother, or whatever else, right? So anyway, I, I, I felt I needed to let that go because it's, it's been going on for, uh, for, for quite some time. Um, a few concepts. You're seeing some visual backdrop. The giganticness of the task of restoring the Andes has been mind-blowing. 9,000 kilometers in length, it's the world's longest mountain range. We're speaking of hundreds of millions of hectares. We're speaking of millions, hundreds of millions of people affected essentially by water. It is the central water system, both for the Amazon basin, as well as for the multi-million capital cities and all the communities in between that depend on Earth, uh, on, 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 on the coast, sorry. The glaciers are melting and they're melting rapidly. I mean, we, I've been 10 years in Peru, I lived there, and I've even myself seen it retracting in such a tremendous way and they are going to disappear. We just said goodbye to the last Venezuelan glacier a few weeks ago. It will never come back. And this is going to continue. Right. Now, fast forward. The, the problem, yes, the water security angle is a huge problem. The glaciers are melting. They're the prime water source there. The only natural substitute to those are natural ecosystems and forests. They are the, cap the, the, the systems that actually capture the water in the highlands and will provide us, when the glaciers are missing, the water for the entire continent. Unfortunately, they have been decimated. It's only 2 to 10% left across the high Andes after 500 years of degradation, deforestation, mostly due to scientists agree, uh, the, the disruption of governance following the co colonial uh, um, aggression, as well as in the introduction of, of sh European sheep and cattle totally inadapted and, and to, the, to the ecosystem. So now Axel and Dina is set there to do something about it. And I want to deep dive into two, three uh, topics that make this work uh, possible. Tino mentioned this, investing in local leaders, people who, has lift, who have lived 
there forever who profoundly understand the culture and how to work with the local people. We need to invest in them, not only in the Andes, but all across the world. Going one step further, and I forgot to mention something, restoring the Andes due to its giganticness is not a short-term project. It has to be multiple decades, maybe a hundred years or more of a vision. Millions of hectares. So by definition, it will require several generations to actually accomplish. And so investing in local leaders that will live you know, in the next 20, 30 years, but also investing in people early that are not even born yet. That is the scale of things we have to look at. Going one step deeper, the only thing arguably that transcends multiple generations is culture. The greatest innovation with a lot of appreciation and respect that Tino has shown in his lifetime was to understand the deep ancestral principles that is ruling and uniting the people he's working with and living with in the Andes. These ancestral principles allowed to unite an entire nation or several nations. And not only does it allow you to have tens of thousands of people, we, we started a few years ago with 100 people, we have now over 40,000 people that are actively involved in the project, by simply recalling these ancestral principles. This is something that quite often in all our finance models and so on is very far away of this. So we have to look at that. And if you look at culture, that is the only thing that transcends over multiple generations. And so behavioral change, long-term care, all these things matter. Our, econo our economic systems, we've talked a lot about that. I don't need to dive too deep into this. They're built to control power and amass wealth. Now, think about the Andes, water security. That fuels the entire economy, the entire societies. So it is our collective responsibility within the region to actually do something about it. So we're knocking the door at the governments to actually help change that narrative of collective care of the commons. Carbon. I, I love the concept of carbon market if it draws finance to the... But quite often what we're seeing right now is the best carbon, best, sorry, it's not the right word, the best carbon projects are actually generating profits that are simply disrespectful to the people that are living locally. We're speaking of margins that are n nowhere else, maybe in some really dark systems, actually anytime near those margins. And so there is something morally profoundly wrong. Right? I'm ending this with a call to global action, we have to go back to a perception of co-living, of the commons, of collective responsibility, and that will not happen if we're not able to understand each other, to listen to each other, to unlearn a lot of things. And I find it quite funny that there's a perception uh, still now we have to include indigenous people, and I, my whole life stands for this and so on. But it's that process quite often just an unlearning, just a listening. Because the systems that are actually driving that degradation are the one we have created in the West. So now is the time, I'm not bashing here, now is the time to really come together. And the way we govern, the way we invest, the way we share, the way we collectively go about things, we need to do this together. And I find this wonderful that we can speak about these topics because seldom is this the case. Thank you so much, Tino. Thank you so much, Florent. Uh, and thank you for the, the beautiful photographs that you shared as well. Um, we're going to go from the Andes to New Zealand. So I'm delighted to have up on stage with me here, Suzanne Craig. Suzanne, in Alexa's notes that she shared with me, she said Suzanne is an ecopreneur, which is a term that's new to, new to me. You're a founder of Tahi. Uh, so Tahi is a, a bioeconomy organization working in New Zealand. Uh, you've regenerated 800 acres of forest through Tahi, and you're going to bring today to the panel both the experience of the practice of regeneration, but also the business case for biodiversity and how you get investors on board for a project like that. So thank you. 
Uh, I know that Tahi was recognised as the most sustainable business in New Zealand, and you're also a board member of WWF New Zealand, of Resta, and your co-founder of the Villas Institute in Switzerland. So welcome, Susan. Uh, let me make a couple of questions to you. I think the first one is kind of the practical one and the, the other one's more inspirational. So the first question is really around um, how you've managed to make the organization Tahi economically viable. So how you've tapped into credit systems and valuation and how that's appeared in your work. Um, and you've obviously got this long story as a ecopreneur. Um, what advice would you have given yourself at the beginning of that journey that would have been useful? Don't do it. <laughs> no, I don't mean that. <laughs> I'm going to stand up, excuse me. So I think perhaps if we go back to why I started Tahi. So I was very fortunate to grow up as the daughter of an ecologist. So large scale restoration, one of the first whole island restorations in New Zealand. So I lived firsthand the power of restoration. So two decades ago, and then I went to work in financial markets on the trading floor in London, so completely different experiences. But for me, Tahi is accumulation of the two. So two decades ago, I decided, over two decades ago, I decided to go back to what I truly loved and knew. So this is when I became, I suppose, the guardian of Tahi. So the core vision was always about how to conserve and strategically restore a biodiverse ecosystem, taking degraded land, integrating the community and making it financially viable to be truly sustainable. So that's a plural values and something that brings a unique balance, how you do integrate those three pillars of decision making. And with that comes complexity. Sometimes the decisions you make don't always make sense, especially when you're looking at the economic sense, they'll go, why are you doing that decision? I think um, the appreciation and perhaps being very clear always about the end mission. We have a hundred year vision. So what do we need to do now to make that hundred vision work and to really embed what we're doing in the community, but keep this piece of land whole and the biodiverse thriving? So Diversity of income streams was one of the things I quickly learned was incredibly important. So ecological restoration and conservation is an expensive business. So, and it's an ongoing expensive business. So how are we going to do that? So of course, um, carbon credits was not on the table at all 20 years ago. So uh, ecotourism, one small income stream, we diversified into honey, which has been by far our most viable business stream. So, and then, um, and then more recently, skincare. So very much our brands are of purpose and of place and 100% of the profits have always been and will always go back into conservation and the community. So our brands are really powering our purpose so when we talked about earlier the nine planetary boundaries, so biodiversity and climate change are the two most vital. If we get those wrong, it doesn't really matter about the rest. So what we have done from the beginning, we put biodiversity in the centre. So all our products, all our decisions were based on effectively what did we need to do to bring the birds back. So birds are the main seed distributors globally and in New Zealand they are the seed distributors, effectively. New Zealand's all about the birds. So birds, animals, insects, what do they need? They need, they need food, they need water, and they need security. So not too different from us. So we started with that principle. We developed a BVI, Biovalues Index, which is very much part of our decision making. And we started with the trees. So we looked at the longevity of the trees, their uh, attractiveness to birds and other insects over the whole year and we turned it into a part of our decision making about what trees to plant. So then we realised very quickly whether you're talking about honey or now the carbon market you're not competing on a level playing field and there are a number of perverse incentives. 
So we're going to come right down to the ground here and talk numbers and we're going to talk carbon market and we're going to talk specifically compliance market in New Zealand. Why the compliance market? The compliance market, as was talked about in the previous two days, is by far the largest market. It also has significantly higher prices and the most trusted market. So if you were, but it takes, just backtracking, it does take a singular element out of a healthy biodiverse ecosystem. And what happens when you do that? You get perverse incentives. So if you're an investor, or you're looking at restoring land, what does that look like? You've got a 500 hectare property. So New Zealand, on the compliance market, 90% is made up of Pinus radiatus, a species that is not indigenous to New Zealand and is a biodiverse desert. Another 6%, roughly, is made up of other monocultural crops, and only a 4% sits in biodiversity. So, with that as your backdrop, let's look at what it means. You have, you're registering on the New Zealand compliance market, emissions trading scheme. So what does that look like 5, 10, 15, 30 years down the line? So we're going to take 15 years, which is about halfway through a pine tree rotation. So you've made 6 million US dollars if you're looking at rotational pine. 15 million if you're looking at permanent pine plantation. And if you're looking at a broadleaf forest, biodiverse thriving forest, you're looking at a loss of 7 million US dollars. So that, I think, gives you an understanding of why we're sitting where we are. So then when you look, you've got a $22 million spread, differentiation, and that does not count for lost opportunity costs. The banks classify plantations as a viable business option. Biodiversity trees, absolutely not. So this is true of New Zealand. You can, and I think the incentives, valuing perverse incentives and forgetting nature in this equation. But this is true of the global market. So the number one traded species globally in the nature-based market is pine. Number two is palm. Number three is hardwoods, predominantly eucalyptus, grown in places that they shouldn't be grown and in densities they should not be grown. So they're more prone to, to pests, floods, um, erosion, and of course, wild, intense fires. So if we go back to New Zealand, and we're going to go back to Tahi, so biodiverse forests, and if you're on the voluntary market, that, that loss of seven million doubles to triples of what your loss will be. But then we'll also look at part of Tahi, a large part of what Tahi sequests and stores is an old forest, 1990 forest, which in the markets equates to zero value. But what does that really mean? New Zealand is one of the 36 biodiversity hotspots globally. Invasive species is the fourth largest driver of biodiversity loss. In New Zealand, it's number one. At Tahi, we spend just under 200,000 US dollars annually keeping invasive species under control. Nobody pays for that, but there are direct correlations between a forest's ability to sequester and store carbon and invasive species. So this forest was a dying forest, it was a paper forest. There was zero undergrowth. The earth, the soil was compacted and embedded. It takes about five years of invasive species erosion before you can, it will even accept a seed. Now it's a thriving, lush forest. No money within the current market. And then a look, if we look again at how we plant, we're looking at strategic restoration. So how many canopies trees do you plant per hectare? How many biodiverse trees? How much spacing between? Because you've got the competition above ground for light. You've got the competition below ground for root systems. That is not taken into consideration for the carbon market. It is the stems they see visible on the ground. But we know that if you give the spacing, you're going to get more biodiversity because you're allowing that uh, the space for it to grow. The trees are going to grow faster and they're going to fruit sooner. You're going to attract that biodiversity back much quicker. So, but there is a real opportunity here with a rapid 
um, improvement in technology and methodologies. We're making visible what was before invisible. And I think if we go back to what I have learned on this journey is absolutely do not limit your horizons. The power of the purpose not only brings amazing people to work with you, but it also helps motivate and hopefully um, for us being financially viable, it's also a big driver. And I think also not to forget the power of the example a proof of concept, those lighthouse projects which are sitting here, because people, if anyone can be inspired from even a small element of what we can do, or feel connected, or vote effectively with their dollar about what they choose to purchase or not, we can make a real difference. So what we do as well is we share all of our learnings on our website as well. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, yeah, a lot of talk about passion, which we're going to hear more about shortly. Uh, a lot of talk about decision making as well. And perhaps when we come back to chatting as a panel, I'd love to go back to explore what decision making looks like in the two organizations we've heard about so far. You know, how do you set up effective decision making structures that are agile enough to be workable, but that are robust enough to be legitimate and, and transparent as well. So maybe we can touch upon that uh, when we have a chat. Okay, so our next panelist is Jojo Mehta. Jojo is CEO of Stop Ecoside International. Uh, you founded Stop Ecoside in 2017, Jojo, along with Polly Higgins, both of you legal pioneers in this area. We had a bit of a chat before you came up here. You described the organization as an advocacy organization um, supporting the establishment of ecocide as a crime at the International Criminal Court. And you've grown a lot in these last few years. So you now have representation and teams in 50 countries and act on multiple diplomatic and political levels. And you have some big news this, this week or last week, wasn't it, that the European Parliament had included ecocide, um, de declared ecocide uh, as part of its own policies. You said it sort of came in through the back door. So curious to hear a little bit more about that as well. Um, I think what we'd love to hear from you first is kind of, kind of a little bit about this concept of ecocide. It may be a familiar term to some of us and you to others. So how is it different from other environmental laws? How does it fit in the sort of broader rights of nature debate and movement? And how is such a, a strong term uh, changing mindsets? So over to you, Jojo. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's an honor to be here. It's just been such an extraordinarily rich and varied day. Um, so yeah, really excited to, to be able to share something about this with you. Um, and I think I should probably start by, I, I was really um, interested in how um, Kate was presenting earlier this, this idea of bridging um, an old paradigm and not necessarily a new, but with a K, <laughs> the new paradigm. Um, and also about how we also heard about how the system itself needs to change and what are the interventions that can do that. Um, and we believe that law and in particular criminal law has a unique uh, power to do this. Um, and that is because we use criminal law to define what is acceptable and not acceptable in society. So it has a particular moral element. And to come to your question about uh, ecocide in relation to existing environmental law. There's plenty of environmental law around the world, but the reality is it is often badly followed, poorly enforced, not well monitored. Um, and that comes down, we believe, to a really profound cultural reason, which uh, is that, that you know our current global economic system is deeply rooted in an, an attitude that separates us from nature and that treats nature as a bank of resources. And that's, um, you know, that, that economic system, as we heard, has been growing up over a long, long time. So although intellectually, most of the people we deal with, and as an international advocacy organization, we, we deal on kind of on two levels, often in closed door meetings with ministers, diplomats, legal advisors, but also in the public with sort of encouraging the broader conversation. You know, we find that firstly, 
it's not a, it's not an arena that's full of villains. It's an arena that's full of people who are the logical result of, you know, whose attitudes are the logical result of generations and generations of this Western attitude that has come to dominate the globe. Um, and intellectually, all of those people understand perfectly well the difficulties that we're in. It's not a, a, about science, it's not about intellect, it's not about those things that people are perfectly capable of understanding. It is actually the, the, that sort of cultural level that prevents us from actually behaving as if we understood. And that's why these particular interventions, and, and we believe ecocide law to be one of them, are so important of the kind that can be strategically kind of inserted into that system in a way that the system understands will accept, can get its head around, but that ultimately actually do really quite a sort of profound shift. And that is something that we believe that ecocide law is capable of doing and we can already see it starting to happen. Because on one level, we're simply introducing a crime into a list of crimes. But by naming the worst harms to nature, and it is the worst ones, we're aiming for an international level crime, so we're not talking about chopping down the trees on the village green, you know, we're talking about really quite serious, you know, transboundary, whole geographical area type uh, damage. Um, when we name those worst harms as crimes and as serious crimes, we are actually saying something quite profound. We're saying if we put, for example, we put ecocide alongside crimes against humanity, war crimes, genocide, we're saying that severe damage to the living world is just as bad, just as wrong, just as dangerous as severe damage to people and to property, which is what our legal system currently mostly focuses on. Um, and that in itself is, you know, creates this quite a sort of profound shift in our understanding of what our responsibility is to the living world around us and how deeply important it is that, that we protect it, just as we want to protect each other. And so that's a really, that, there's a really sort of strong cultural aspect here. But I think the other thing that, I, that, that has been coming back to me a little bit across different talks today as well is that power, and, and we were talking earlier about the power of um, belonging, the power of feeling that we're all part of something. You know, that th those aspects show up also where we deal with this, this uh, question. So, you know, no politician, for example, wants to be the first person at a party, metaphorically speaking. You know, they want to feel that the conversation is safe for them to have. And that's where, for example, you know, our aspect of creating a very cross-sector, cross-feeding, very fertile conversation is incredibly important because then that concept of ecocide and the word itself has such power, you know, ecocide, you know, people, it, it feels drastic. It feels like, you know, the murder of the environment. It can be really easily understood. The more that that concept enters the general lexicon, the more familiar the, the lawmakers are with it, the more familiar the legal advisors are with it, the more legal and academic discussions happen around it, and so on. Um, and so what you then end up with is a situation where, oh, I don't want to be the one that doesn't know about this. Um, you get a kind of FOMO at government level, if you like. <laughs> um, and perhaps the single most important milestone in this journey was what you see above you, above me here, which is the definition of ecocide. So over the years there had been, I mean the term was first coined in the early 70s, the first UN Environment Conference was the first time it was used on the diplomatic stage by Swedish Premier Olaf Palmer. But it kind of sat in a bit of a legal and political backwater. But there were a number of people that tried to define it. But of course one lawyer saying I think it should look like this is not strong enough for a government conversation to be triggered. But what happened in 2020 was we had Swedish parliamentarians approach us and say, you've obviously, you know, this is your area of expertise. By that point, we had a charitable foundation. We've been working in the area for a number of years. And they said, could you convene an international panel of lawyers to come up with a definition of ecocide that we could take to our government and they could credibly propose it as an international crime? And on the basis of that, we were able to convene 12 top lawyers from different parts, all from different parts of the world and different legal expertise. And this is the definition that they came up with. Ecocide means unlawful or wanton acts committed with knowledge that there's a substantial likelihood of severe and either widespread or long-term damage to the environment being caused by those acts. 
Now, that's actually got very strong legal precedent in other treaties and other parts of the Rome Statute, which is the governing document of the International Criminal Court. But it's also super simple. It fits on the back of a business card, and that's dead handy when you're dealing with a busy politician. Um, and, and it also means that, you know, you or I can understand it. It's very, very straightforward. And to put it on a very personal level, since that definition was launched, which is actually, <laughs> in two days' time, it will have been exactly three years ago, so 2021, 22nd of June, since that day, things changed for me. Before that day, I was able to read all the emails in my inbox. <laughs> so since then, it's just been... Um, and I know there are others in this room that have had that experience when something's, you know, really sort of caught the zeitgeist. Um, and what's actually happened is it's catalyzed political, legal, academic conversation all around the world. Um, and just to give a brief flavor of where we're now at, um, we have a situation where, where in, 20, in 2019, no governments were talking about this. And I had a lovely moment of recognition earlier when um, Harvey put up the picture of Minister Ralph Reagan Vanu, who is a close, close ally of ours. And Vanuatu is absolutely the state that's leading this conversation at the global level. In 2019, they announced to the Assembly of States parties in The Hague, the ICC, the International Criminal Court, that all member states should consider adding ecocide to the Rome Statute. Five years later, literally, it wasn't quite last week, it was a couple of months ago, but the European Union has created and adopted a directive that addresses conduct comparable to ecocide. And that's the first time the word has been used in EU legislation. And now EU states within the next two years have to harmonize with that. Now, the way they've defined it isn't quite the same as this. It's not, it, we would say it's not completely perfect, but it's a massive step in the right direction. Um, and that's really pushed the dial as well at the global level. So we are now in, in collaboration with states like Vanuatu and some of these small island states that are absolutely on that front end of, of climate vulnerability to bring an initial group of co-sponsoring states together to actually propose an amendment. Um, and we believe that that's actually reachable potentially even this year, which would be incredibly exciting if that happened. So what I want to kind of show here is that there is this extraordinary m movement, if you like, that's in full acceleration at the moment that I would bet that at least some people in this room may not even have heard of. How many of you had heard the word ecocide or heard about ecocide law before? Okay, good. It's a lot more than it was last year <laughs> in, terms of, in terms of asking a room that. Um, but, you know, there are still, you know, many people on the street, for example, who won't have heard the term before. And yet this conversation has moved very, very fast at government level. And this, I think, is, um, and I want to just make this my final point in a sense, and it's something that I think has also come up within this room as well, is that it's not just about, you know, what we're saying. It's about how that conversation is spreading and how people are hearing it and listening to it. So some of the rooms I go into, I would dearly love to be able to do what Mac does and say, you know, what do you deeply love the most? But on a, in a diplomatic round table in New York, it's tricky to, be tricky to do that when you've got like half an hour. But, you know, the, that, that aspect of belonging is nonetheless, you know, surfacing in that place. And, you know, which governments are talking about it? Oh, do we need to join this conversation? You know, all of that is important. What's also important is how are they hearing what we're saying. And actually bringing that kind of, I mean, there are two aspects here that I really want to highlight. One is positivity. People respond to positive energy. It's, you know, with the subject matter we deal with, we could be talking about what's awful happening in the world all the time. I mean, the number of ecocides, where they are, what they are. I mean, if we focused on that, I very much doubt we'd have got where we are. What we do is essentially always come from the position of, for this audience, for this person, what is the positive thing here? And of course, it's so fundamentally basic. It speaks, and, and, and actually, it's, this is one of the reasons that we have a lot of support from indigenous spokespeople, actually, because it speaks to something so deep and so obvious. You know, I remember we had a panel in, in, in um, one of the cops, um, where we had a, a young First Nations speaker and the moderator asked her, how does this law fit in with the cultural laws and, and um, sort of frameworks in your culture? And she actually had to be asked the question three times before she understood it because it was so obvious. 
It was so obvious. And eventually she just kind of went, duh, rule number one, don't damage Mother Earth. You know, and it's, it's, it's like this, this kind of very obvious, obvious thing. And it's like, how does this land for different people? And believe it or not, we have international investment networks saying to governments, legislate for ecocide. We want to know where our investments are going to be safe. So there is something positive in every possible area about doing this. And so feeling into that and that positivity has really hugely helped the conversation to move. And my very last thing would be to say the other thing is because it is so highly, highly specific. I mean, in many of the places that I end up speaking, you know, I often hear people with incredible five point plans to save the world. I mean, if we did them all, you know, I mean, just to be amazing. But of course, because what we're doing is so incredibly precise, it doesn't bump up against kind of political partisanship or, you know, other people's agendas. It's just like, actually, we just want to criminalise the worst harms to nature. Um, I was asked once, you know, what's Stop Ecocide's position on degrowth? I mean, I might personally think degrowth is a fantastic idea, but I was like, well, actually, we don't have a position on degrowth. All we want to do is criminalise the worst harms to nature. End of story. And you can see the politicians all kind of going, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but so yeah, so the specificity I think is has, has been very, very helpful as well. But yeah, so I think I'll, I'll leave it there, otherwise I'll, I'll be going on too long, but thank you. Thank you so much, Jojo, wonderful. Um, yeah, how does change happen? And sometimes it can feel as though change is very, very slow, very, very incremental. And then suddenly, whoosh, it all comes at once. Um, curious to know then how you kind of manage that, right? And our colleagues who spoke earlier are also dealing with rapid expansion of their organisation. So how you manage that? Um, I said this wasn't an academic panel, but it is a panel that's going to talk about art and about love. So we've got some tasty themes to get into. Uh, I did introduce Jane Frary earlier, but I wanted to go back to the piece of beautiful artwork that you have at our entrance hall here, the Falls of Caledon. Um, and you may not have seen it, so do make sure you see it before you leave. If you're exiting the building, it's on the left, at the bottom of the stairs. And it captures uh, in charcoal uh, many of the animals, species, and mammals of the highlands, some of which are extinct, some of which are on the red list, some of which are just carcasses because they're no longer there. And uh, Jane and I were talking about it before, before today, and she explained that she'd used charcoal as well because of its impermanence, right? So one swift movement, movement, you can wipe all those beautiful animals off this wonderful piece of artwork as well. So the, the fragility and the impermanence of, of that beauty is there as well. Um, Jane, you've got a fascinating life story. Uh, you've worked for a long time as, a, as an artist and an activist, and you've interwoven those two elements of your life. You worked for a long time as a humanitarian activist, and you told me that about three years ago you pivoted to be an activist that also looks at Gaia and conflict and tension around Gaia. So we'd love to hear more about that experience of yours as an artist, as an activist, uh, and also how you've used art to bridge the human nature connection. So welcome, Jane. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to stand up. Thank you. It's quite sad, really, being here, the second last speaker, because these days have been so phenomenal. Such incredible people, such incredible speakers, and just so much more knowledge, and for me, research. Um, being here and agreeing to come down here and do the artwork for here, this is how I practice my art. This is all part of my creativity. So yes, I'm a research-led artist, not particularly academic, but nonetheless, I try to learn as much as I can. Um, and for many years, I have worked on the dark side of human nature. I've worked on war and confrontation, on 
humanization or dehumanization. I've worked on trauma and my approach to my practice is to be as immersive as possible because I want to use all five senses and that's something that came up the other day. I lived and worked in Palestinian refugee camps. I chose to live with families because I created a seminal project which was about the Palestinian Nakba of 1948 and about their ethnic cleansing. And I also lived in the West Bank and I had my fair share of rubber bullets and of tear gas. And when people ask me, what medium do you work in? I often say that I work in with multimedia, but I also work with a good dollop of adrenaline. I certainly had a good dollop of adrenaline. And living with people and being with people and living their lives, that gave the work strength and credibility. The pandemic came and then I decided at that time that was a kind of, well, we all know what happened at the pandemic and during those very quiet moments I decided actually, you know what, I wanted to move away from anthropocentricity and move more to ecocentricity, kind of going from human rights to Gaia's rights. And I have to say, we all know in this room and at this conference that actually the greatest emergency of all, we know what the greatest emergency of all is, but I would say the greatest emergency of all is the absence of emergency. Because everybody in this room, we all get it. But when we go out in the street, how many people really do get what we've all been talking about? How many politicians do? I don't think they, they don't seem to at all. World leaders that are holding us to ransom, that are leading to us all, humanity towards the abyss, do they get it? I was a little bit frustrated by yesterday's conversation because as brilliant as it all was and whatever, but we were talking about incentivization and you know, these business models and things. And I was just thinking, well, wait a minute. Don't these guys have any kids? Don't they have grandkids? Don't they understand where we're heading? And I've come to the conclusion, because I've been pondering this for some time, that actually what's really absent is imagination. And we artists, we work in the business, if you want, of imagination. And we are, we are communicators. We have our kind of language, and with our skills and sensibilities, we strike at people's emotions. The emotional mind is far quicker than the rational mind. We act as reflectors. We act as mirrors to society, and we help people to see things that maybe see things differently, see things in other ways. When I talk about the arts, of course, I'm talking generically. I'm talking about cinema, theater, fine arts, writing, poets, music, etc. How many people saw Don't Look Up, the film Don't Look Up? There was a fantastic example of art really touching the imagination. But I'm not a practicing artist in normal times because I do get the emergency. So it's not enough for me to build up a body of work and then to exhibit in white cube galleries and you know have nice openings with glasses and wine or whatever. For me, that's pretty pointless given where we're at. So I'm proactive and I create projects. I have been working for a tree cycle year at the Trees for Life tree nursery up in the highlands of Scotland. I'm really lucky. It's 30 minutes down the road from where I hail from. And of course, Alan is the founder, which everybody will know. And the thing about being in the tree nursery is, yes, you get those benefits that we talked about on the first day. But for me, it's not that. I'm really giving something back to Gaia. And the great thing about being in there as well is that it's an incredible place, not only for growing trees, but for growing ideas. There's this whole thing about seeds and the seeds for ideas. So I, I'm brimming with ideas. I'm brimming with projects. Finance is always the problem, so 
given if anybody's got any ideas for financing nature-based solutions then that would be a lovely co coffee conversation um, but I also have been doing another project lately and that has been and that's been through my work there my father was a great climber and mountaineer and um, and using his legacy up in the Highlands, I have initiated a citizen science project reaching out to the climbing fraternity. And of course, our mountains are now absolutely crawling with climbers. We have so many people now who are up in the, you know, climbing the Scottish mountains. And reaching out to them and then with a little bit of training, they are going up to Montane Heights. Sorry, it's only 600 meters. It's not nearly the heights that you were talking about earlier to identify the seeds and collect seeds because we only have 1% left, extraordinarily, of, of montane scrub in the highlands of Scotland due to our appalling land management and exploitation. And my other project, which I'm going to start when I go back home, and I wish actually we all had time and we could just all do it together. So what it is, is that I'm going to be taking groups of people out into the woods, the forest, and for walks. And they're going to be taking a paper and pencil with them, but they don't have to be artists. And we're going to sit down and we're going to study trees, but we're going to tune in to an aspect of a tree. We're going to really go for the detail. We're going to study a cluster of leaves or whatever it is. We're going to look at the textures and the light falling on it and the color, all of that. And then we're going to remember what we're looking at. And then we're going to turn to our paper with our pencils and we're going to draw it. And then we're going to repeat the process. Now, if you think of that flow, you have the eye going to the tree, to a tiny little detail. The memory is going to pass back into our heads, down through our arms, down into the pencil, and onto the paper. There's something in that that's a real connectivity. We've slowed down, we're tuning in. It's almost like we are telling the tree that we just love it. We're interacting with that tree. And it reminds me when I draw butterflies and I draw moths, fine detail, and I stare into the eye of the butterfly. There's a reverence in that. So what I'm hoping with these walking groups, that I am literally connecting people through this process, through drawing, through quietening down, through a kind of process of meditation, I am literally connecting people with nature. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jane. Your friend and colleague, Alan, is up next. Alan, lovely to have you up here on the stage. Thank you for accepting the invitation to be here. Uh, you're an ecologist, you're a photographer, you're an entrepreneur as well, so you've grown Trees for Life to be the organization that it is today and with all its renown and all the prizes that you've won and been awarded to the organization as well. Um, I think what's above all interesting is this journey you've been through, uh, the journey of your organization and your personal journey. Uh, so an invitation to, to share some of that journey with us here and what can serve as inspiration for us as we go on to our journeys working on restoring relationships with nature-based solutions. Over to you, Alan. Thank you. So on. I'm going to come and stand here. So thanks for the introduction. Thanks, Justin, for the invitation to be here. Thanks to fellow speakers and all those in the last couple of days, and to all of you for being here too, for having interest in this subject. What I want to talk about is my personal journey of restoring relationship with nature. I'm Scottish, I grew up in central Scotland, and I grew up in a comfortable life on a physical sense, one of the wealthier countries in the world. My family weren't rich, but we weren't poor, we had everything we needed. But I also grew up completely deprived of one of the essential ingredients of a healthy human life. I was deprived of daily contact with healthy, wild nature. Scotland is one of the most ecologically deprived countries in the world. 
We heard about the Andes with 10% of its forests left. I've been there and seen that. In Scotland, we have 1% of our forests left, 1%. And all our large mammal species have been exterminated. The bear, the wolf, the lynx, the moose, the list goes on and on. So I grew up deprived of that. And I followed a conventional career path through school, university. I studied electronics, which I lost interest in very quickly. But uh, in my late teens and early 20s, I began to travel. And I went to North America, South America, and subsequently I've been in many parts of the world where I experienced healthy ecosystems with their full complement of species. And I came back to Scotland to join the Findhorn community where I live. And some of you may know about Findhorn. It's an intentional spiritual community founded on the principle of co-creation with nature, which we heard about from Lila of indigenous peoples in the past uh, this morning. The idea, the knowledge that nature has spirit, has consciousness, and that we can communicate with that. And when we approach that relationship with respect, with care and love, seeming miracles can happen. If you know the story of Findhorn, it started in a caravan park in sand and people, by meditating with the plants, by tuning in with what they called the devas, the spirit of each plant species, they grew cabbages that were 40 pounds in size. So that attracted me, and I worked in one of the gardens at Findhorn for several years, learning that for myself. I also began going out to Glen Affric, one of the best remnants of the old Caledonian forest, the closest thing I could find to a healthy forest in Scotland. And what struck me was there were these beautiful trees, 200, 250 years old, but there were no young trees. It's what I came to call the geriatric forest. It was like going to an old people's home. Lots of venerable beings at the end of long lives and no adults, no teenagers, no children, only tiny babies, little seedlings that were getting eaten to death by deer and sheep in the absence of predators. And over time, tuning in, I felt this forest was calling out for help. In 1986, I spent a year organizing a big conference, a week-long event with 300 people called One Earth, A Call to Action, which was based on the premise that we know what the problems of the world are in terms of the environment. We also know the solutions, but what's missing is the will and the commitment to implement those solutions. And of course, today, we're in exactly the same situation. In the final session, we asked anybody who felt inspired to stand up in front of 300 people and make a commitment to do something positive for the planet. I stood up and said, I commit myself to launch a project to restore the Caledonian forest. And in that moment, I had no idea how I was going to do that. I had no training in ecology. I had no funding. I had no access to land. But I had the most important thing. I had this inner connection I'd been nurturing, restoring relationship with nature. And I had a passion for this place. And that's how Trees for Life began. It took me three years to raise money, to make contact with landowners, to reach agreement. And we started protecting a few trees in 1989 with tubes. And in 1990, we fenced off 50 hectares with 100,000 pine seedlings that were on average 10 years old, but about this high because of grazing from deer. That area has been protected now for 34 years, and I go out there every year. I take groups out there, and I've taken camera crews out there and journalists and all sorts of things, and there's one particular tree we always go to. It's just inside the fence. It's easily accessible because it's a tough climb uphill to get to it. And that tree is in all my photographs. I've written about it. And it's come to be known as the champion tree. 20 years after the fence went up, I'm out with a colleague with something called a laser hypsometer, which is like a laser pointer. You aim at the base of the tree and the top. It calculates the angle and tells you the height. We measured all the trees there. Guess which one was the biggest tree? The one that got all the human care and attention. We did the same thing four years ago, 30 years after the fence went up. It's still the biggest tree. And out of that has come my own personal understanding of something that's been implicit, I think, in quite a few of the presentations here, but I want to really name it and nail it, which is that human love 
nurtures, amplifies, and strengthens the life force of whatever it is directed to. Human love amplifies, strengthens, and, life, and nurtures the life force of whatever it's directed to. Many of you perhaps are parents, and you'll know that children flourish in an atmosphere of love. Anybody who has a pet knows that. And last night we heard an experience of a dog that loves to be caressed, you know. And we call, we call gardeners who have a special connection with plants, they have a green thumb. I actually think it's the wrong term. It should be a green heart because it's the heart that makes the difference. The thumb only does the work of the heart. So that for me is about restoring relationship with nature. And I believe that's the relationship indigenous people have still. I'm learning to be indigenous in the highlands of Scotland. And out of that has come um, a series of guiding things in my life, which I want to share with you. Um, we heard this morning about several things beginning with the letter R. And yesterday we had three things beginning with the letter T. I want to give you four things beginning with the letter P now. Um, we've actually got one of them in the title of this conference, Positive, Positivity. You know, we need to focus on the positive. It's really difficult when there's so much destruction and negativity on the planet, but the positivity is where we can make a difference. The second one is purpose. Oh, sorry, the second one is passion. What do I feel really passionate about? What do I really care? What is it that is in my heart that I will do um, whatever it takes for? For me, it's the Caledonian forest. The third one then is purpose, aligning that passion and positivity with purpose, restoring the forest, helping with the healing of the earth. Mother Earth is a living being and has an ability to heal herself. I've been to Mount St. Helens where a volcano erupted in Washington state, covering everything with ash, and I saw the forest recovering. But we can help that recovery process. We can assist it. That's what restoration is about, helping the Earth's natural recovery. And the last one then is power. Passion, purpose, positivity, and power. And I'm not talking about the old form of power, which is what the conventional world runs on, power over others, power of the rich over the poor, of men over women, of whites over black, and of humans over nature. I'm talking about the power from within, the power to live my passion, the power to live my purpose, to make a difference. And you can see I'm a small man. I'm five foot four. I'm not very big. I was standing next to somebody yesterday who was like towering over me. Um, but I found I have a limitless source of power inside myself by listening to my heart, by reconnecting with nature and responding to that call. And that is how Trees for Life has come into being. I worked with it for 31 years. It's planted over a million trees, now over two million since I left. It's regenerated many more, which is much better than planting. And it's beginning the work of restoring lost species. And it's a 250 year vision to bring back a healthy forest because that's how long it's going to take to get mature trees again. We have to think big. And my vision is bigger than that too. I ran another project a few years ago, uh, late 1990s, called Restore the Earth, with the idea that we need the first shared task for all nations, all people, all humanity, to be restore the earth. Our culture has been described as a culture of takers. We take, we take, we take. And I believe we need to become the givers who give back more than we take. And we can give three things back to the earth. We can give back space by reducing our demands on the planet. I chose to become vegan in 1979 because I learned that a vegan diet needs 10% of the land to grow the food I eat than a meat-based diet. We can give back life. That's what ecological restoration is all about, helping to restore the life to healthy ecosystems. And then crucially, this other quality, which is uniquely human, I believe, we can give love. We can return the planet to a state of health and balance with our love. And I think humans are unique in that respect because we are the species which has now learned to know and understand the integrated web of life that is all things on the planet. 
I sometimes ask people, what do polar bears know of tropical rainforests? Probably not very much. What do blue whales know of the Himalayas? Probably not very much. We humans know all those things. We're understanding the web of life, and we can nurture it with our love and with our care. That is the task ahead of us. And each one of you can do at least as much as me because we all have the same access to that power in our hearts. And I'll leave you there with that thought. Thank you, Alan. Thank you to all our speakers. Um, wow, there's, there's a lot there. Uh, some of the kind of themes that I feel are, are here, and then I want to ask you what you think the themes that are here we want to kind of go into, but um, I think there's the whole question about governance and decision making, about how change happens, um, how do we manage growth as it happens, and funding. There's questions that you, that you rose, Jojo, about language and law. We heard a lot now through art and through Alan's speech around connection, inwardly, outwardly. What does that mean? What does that look like? How do you nurture that? We heard about love as well. Human love amplifies, strengthens, and nurtures all life forms. So thanks, Alan. Um, we've got about 20 minutes to have a chat with everybody in the room. And the question I'm putting to you guys now is, what is the burning issue I'd really like to talk about before I leave this room? So what's really kind of burning inside me based on what you've heard from this panel? So what's kind of, what's sort of inside here and kind of not resolved and you really like to get your teeth into? What I'd like you to do is turn to the person next to you, preferably person that you know less well, so if you're sitting next to a friend, look, look behind or look in front of you or try and find someone that you know less well, if you can. And the question for you two to explore, or three or four, whatever group you're in, and we'll do the same on stage. What's the burning issue I really like to get my teeth into based on what I've heard here before I leave this room? And then we'll kind of listen to what's in the room and we'll see what we go into. Okay, so a few minutes to do that and then we'll come back. So what's in the room? Like, let's get a microphone just going round and let's kind of... Let's hear a few ideas and then see what we, where we take this. Um, who wants to go first? Hello. Oh, not on yet. Oh, yes. Um, so we had a question for Suzanne, which was, it was great to hear about your example, but we weren't quite sure how you managed to finance what you've done so far in view of obviously the very expensive nature of your particular intervention compared to doing the hideous sort of pine forest. So a bit more about that would be great. And then we all had the same point, which was, I think, common to many people across these three days, any practical positive tips that you think that we should take away that we can implement or we can use to influence other people? Hello, uh, Sean Croto. Um, I would just, one point that we were reflecting on is, how do we take the conversation we're having here in this room amongst those that are deeply positive about nature and take it out to the wider community, especially those people that are maybe suffering from housing deprivation or they're struggling with um, food insecurity, and the environmental crisis and the, the nature crisis and the biological crisis that we're facing isn't front and center for them day to day facing those other challenges. Thank you. is Karen Sudmeyer. Natalie's going to love this question. What points to bring forward to COP20 to COP30? What action points to bring forward to policymakers at COP30? No, so I, Thank you. We'll take one more. We'll take one more which is the lady here and then we'll come back and we'll hear the room again. Hi there. Mary Dupar ODI Climate and Development Knowledge Network. Um, so I'm from the north of Scotland and my friend here is from Nepal and we were both having a conversation about how environmental education could be improved and how the national curricula in our countries are not fit for purpose. So children are born with that wonder of nature but often um, there's 
not necessarily a family-based learning environment where they can really uh, grow to appreciate nature. And that needs to be a kind of localized experience. And we were very inspired by your words on, on your journey, Alan, in that regard. And um, how do you make a more localized connection with nature in which children can really grow and especially maybe melding investments in formal and informal education? Thanks. Super. Okay, so um, panelists, and, and I and I feels as though the point about education may be linked to the point that the gentleman here is it Alan, your name? Sure. Sean. Uh, Sean raised about you know how do we make this theme meaningful to communities that have other concerns as well. So I think there are what I would call kind of the the practical questions around funding, around action. Uh, and around action leading up to COP30. And then there's this issue of uh, how we take this out to the wider communities and maybe integrate this into education as well. Um, who wants to go first? Yeah, super, Tino. Have you got a microphone? I want to try to answer on the name of the communities. The communities are upset and tired of being the front page of the magazine or just part of the video. They want to be part of the solution. They are demanding for jobs. It's ridiculous and also hate that people come from the big cities thinking that they have the main formula for everything because they have the PhD or the master's degree for that. And even worse, there are people from the big cities coming to tell them how to be organized and it's amazing, you know, what, what's working right now in the big cities that is not going to work inside of the local communities? Local communities has thousands of years with that uh, organization. It's, sometimes we must to abandon the hypocrisy, you know? I, I have been doing this uh, conservation on the last 35 years. Believe me. Everybody called me practitioner. They never called me like, is this a, a good uh, experience as a technician? No. Why? Because I don't have the degree. I don't have the master's degree. I don't have the PhD degree for that reason. No, no, no. That, that is not acceptable. That is a practitioner thing. Okay, thank you so much. Being a practitioner, being a practitioner, I already planted 10 million, more than 10 million trees, helping to create the more than 16 protected areas. What you done with your all your... PhD degrees. <laughs> and uh, talking with the locals, I'm, I'm going to only finish my intervention with this. And you are going to enjoy. One time I had been climbing the mountains and above 4,600 meters level, one elder called me and said, hey boss, come. Let's chew in some coca leaves. Okay, it's no problem. And I saw some tears coming from his eyes and said, come on, look at that mountain. Yeah, what's the problem? That mountain, his name is Salkantai, means the demon mountain. 30 years ago, was full of snow. Now, nothing more. Look at this. He said, probably we are doing something bad and the mother earth is not going to give us the opportunity to see more snow covering the mountain. We are doing something bad. Hey boss, we needed to plant more trees. Said, thank you so much. This is the best lesson that I ever received. But who's giving me that? A savage, a campesino. Why in the cities, with, there are millions of people, they don't think like it is savage. In that way, we can just reduce the damage that we are doing to the Mother Earth. Many times I use this word, said, we are making shit on the Mother Earth. We're not protecting it. This is the feeling of the local communities. Thank you. I want to add uh, uh, something. Um, just to the COP question, I find it, you mentioned hypocrisy. No. What is the number, I think, seven trillion dollars still in subsidies, nature harming subsidies? That is hypocrisy. No? So that's, that's a big, big point that we need to continue uh, uh, targeting. But the other reflection, um, there is a current debate whether tree planting made sense or not. We're so bored of this debate. <laughs> 
and it's it seems to be important to donors and 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 so on and great our personal reflection on that is and we start from a restoring nature enabling restoration point of view is that yes there is an so first of all in nature one tree doesn't make any difference one tree or, or two trees or it is all about the system right so if you focus like a product on one single tree doesn't make any big difference although the tree is important however in in Axinandina, after 10 million trees and so on what we're seeing that although there is an ecological direct benefit water security especially and many other things biodiversity and soil and so on the most important part is actually act the human act of planting and caring for that tree that is the thing that's gonna transcend generation and lifetimes and that that symbolic act it's practical because you plant the trees and you care for it but that symbolic act is actually what unites the people and and that collective spirit is what we need to bring back to the cup it's what we need to foster and not only among communities on the ground but globally among companies among governments and so on that is the feeling of collective action and collective care we need to foster again and so yes tree counting, how many died, survival rate, and so on, all important somewhere in the conversation. But focus on the beautiful act of actually symbolically bringing back life, right? And I think a lot of our economic systems have been quite good at, at hiding those opportunities. Thank you. I would agree, that physical act of planting trees. So we work with a lot of children and, and that act of them coming and planting trees has that association and learning about strategic restoration, looking at this amazing power of wetlands. And then back to the question about how I've managed to fund this. So we've restored or planted 8.8 .8 million trees and the funding is predominantly, I had some initial funding that obviously ran out very quickly. Um, <laughs> so, but I did invest in a business, which was the honey. And very lucky in New Zealand, we have a specific honey called Manuka, which is fairly expensive, but it's also very expensive to actually get the honey. So there is good reasons for that, and it's also very rare. But I started very small, 11 years ago, with a few hives, I think 30 or something. Now we have now we have considerably more, um, and we work all through the communities. And we also work through the schools. We have Bees in Schools program, which is about so much more than um, bees, and it's integrated into the school curriculum. So it's learning about strategic restoration as well. But the bees also have fun, the restoration, they fund the um, uh, invasive species. And we have on the front of our honey jars, every single jar from the beginning has had a bird on it because that's what we're about. And it's had biodiversity positive, which I think 11 years ago, absolutely no one knew what that was about. They still don't know what it's about, but I was absolutely, that was one of my non-negotiables that had to be there. And it's through, I suppose, that business, which has grown, we're now in 29 countries globally. So, but with every jar of honey, it carries a story about what we're doing. And and it empowers the community projects and it empowers the tree planting. So, I hand you. Thank you. Yeah, I, um, I think I'd like to think about the how do we, um, I mean, f from, from the perspective of the work that I'm doing, it is really relevant what uh, I think it was Sean that brought up about how to, how to do. Um, approach the wider community who might not have environment front and centre, um, understandably because of, you know, cost of living, just getting bread on the table, you know, dealing with holding down a job and, you know, by the time you get to the end of the day and you've managed to get the kids to bed, if you get an hour, half an hour of TV, you're probably happy. Um, now, what the, the, the issue I see here is that, you know, in terms of climate and nature and so on is that 
what I suppose we might call the corporate PR machine has done a rather good job of kind of putting all the blame onto the public and basically saying, well, you know, we, we carry on producing this stuff because you're asking us to. It's a supply and demand thing. Um, and, you know, effectively everybody needs to take responsibility for every little thing they do in order to address this crisis. Now, it doesn't matter how many lights you switch off or how many bits of vegetable not covered in plastic you go and buy, that's not going to make the difference. I mean, a bit like your one tree, you know, and that's why something like ecocide law is so important because it's actually pushing the responsibility back up the production chain and back up that, that sort of value chain um, away from the consumer or the, uh, what I prefer to think of as the citizen or the, you know, the community member, um, back to the level of decision making at the highest levels of government and industry, because that is what makes the difference. I mean, if I go into the supermarket and everything's covered in plastic, I did not decide that. Why should I have to pay three times the price to not have the plastic? You know, effectively, we're looking at going to the, the sort of top of the, the decision making tree, if you like. And that's why I think um, this particular law is so important, um, because it actually deals with individuals at the top level. Um, but also, I think there's the thing about connection, and this comes back to what Ellen was talking about, about connecting with nature, and I think it speaks to the whole educational piece. I mean, you know, a child in nature doesn't have to be told how to connect with nature. <laughs> it's just something that comes naturally to us. If anything, we educate it out of people. Um, so, you know, if there's a specific thing that, that could be encouraged in every local community educational institution it's some way of connecting with nature even if that's just having a tomato growing in a pot on your you know on your windowsill whatever it is but that connection because we we don't love what we can't connect to and we don't protect what we don't love so that connection feels to me to be the the primary thing and just a very brief thing on cop 30 um Governments and you know, sort of G7, G20, there's a lot of focus at the moment on bioeconomy, which of course means lots of different things to lots of different people. But I'm kind of hoping that whatever people think bioeconomy is, they will all agree on what it is not. And what it is not is destroying the ecosystems upon which it depends. So let's take ecocide law to COP30. <laughs> So just before I go to Jane and Alan, I think this point about how we take action into the community, I think is kind of, I feel it's, it's, it's sort of buzzing. We've got questions online and people are really keen to know kind of practical actions that people can take forward from here. Um, we've heard online as well, a kind of desire from a, an engineering educator to explore how we can educate engineers. How can we take this theme to communities that perhaps you know, of their list of really critical issues, nature-based solutions probably isn't even in the top 10, let's be honest. I think about Brazil, for example, as well. And actually, people, people aren't concerned about nature. They're concerned about much more real daily things in their lives. The point about um, involving families. Are there others in the room who have experience of this? So, you know, if we're looking for kind of practical action points, and Sean, I wonder if, you know, where did your question come from? Is it something you've been exploring as well? But are there other people in the room that have... Um, really practical examples of how you take what we've been discussing here into the real world, how you take it into families, how you take it into communities that have other priorities, how you take it into groups that don't necessarily work with that. Is anybody kind of brave enough to share some real life examples? Yeah, Mac. I think the the question is um, is probably only used by the somebody who's already made a decision to do nothing. So I, I had at one time a diagnosed a brain tumour and I couldn't drive, so I caught trains. I was going to go and speak at a festival and I miss connections, come tumbling down Oxford uh, train station steps, jump into a cab and shout at the guy unnecessarily loudly, get me to the festival. And there's a yawn from this enormous guy in the seat whose name is Mohammed. And he says, um, that is no way to go to a festival. So, so we have a chat and I'm getting more and more flustered. And he says, so what do you do as he slowly gets going? And eventually uh, he says, well, he said, your life is so great. You get to swan around going to these places and speaking and doing all this good stuff. You know, me, I'm just stuck in this cab and I lose patience. I just look here, Mohammed. You're in this cab 
and you have between sort of five and 30 or 40, whatever people who get into your cab, you could just decide that you run mentoring sessions or coaching sessions or in, in sessions, whoever comes into your cab has come for a reason. And they've come because you need to inspire them. You need to use the time you have to find the questions that will enliven that person's day and send them out of your cab, knowing that they can do something simply by how they buy shop, how they treat people at a restaurant, simply how they interact with neighbors, simply how they are with their children or their partners, simply by being the person that they are. Muhammad gets very excited, he said, I never thought of that, I'll give it a go. Gate crashes us through the festival, lifts me physically onto the stage and shouts my name and I begin to speak. I just think all of us, if we choose to embody it in every second, in every interaction, in every way, the big ideas will come. But meanwhile, there's always the next phone call, the next email, the next social media posting, which asks us the question, how serious are we and will we do this? How do you bring these kinds of issues to people who have much more immediate real needs? One of many ways. So I showed earlier the donut unrolled. And if you remember, there were four quadrants. And the first one is, how can all the people of this place thrive? And what would it mean for nature here to thrive? How can we live within planetary boundaries and respect people worldwide? So when we first started using that framework with cities, one of the first cities we did it was in um, Portland and in Philadelphia in the US. And this was in 2019. And we went to Philly and it was, we were with the C40 who work on climate change. So ostensibly we were working with the city council and the community about climate change. And you go into Philly and you, people say, are you kidding me? Sorry, you want to come here and talk to me about climate? I don't even know my kids will get to school safely and back. I can't feed my children. Why, why would I? Why would? So you need, to, so we found that framework meant we start with how can all the people in this place thrive? Why, where are people not thriving? And land that conversation and get that on the table. And that's why I think it's really important to connect the social justice and the ecological, and they connect. So then we found out from ecologists and schools, districts in the room, that if you think about any city, there's always the leafy neighborhoods, and then there's the neighborhoods with no trees. And you can guess which ones cost more and are better, nicer to live in. And there's powerful research that shows in the neighborhoods that have no trees on an urban heat island day, on a hot, hot day, there's very clear research that shows kids have less cognitive capacity to learn. It translates into worse grades. So you get a clear connection between leafy neighborhoods, local ecology and social justice in terms of educational outcomes. And when you, when you can start Talking about those connections, people realize actually this is a social justice issue. Uh, and, and so we're still not talking about climate change, we're talking about the local ecology of place, but showing those four lenses and then inviting people to draw all the connections between. I found the power of it is people often arrive and they already arrive in one of those four quadrants. I'm here for local social justice, I'm here for climate change, I'm here for fair trade and rights worldwide, I'm here for the local river. And once you land and you stand where you are, once you can see that the thing you care about is visible, you're much more able to lift your head and hear other people and hear other connected issues. So this is one of many, many frameworks, but frameworks that invite us to look at everything together mean that people can arrive with their immediate issues, be heard and see how they're connected to others. Any final voices on that before I go back to Jane and Alan? Okay, so. So I think uh, education. Education is absolutely vital. I think that we, we owe it to the younger generation, to our kids and to our grandchildren. We have to 
help them, we have to give them a coping mechanism. And their coping mechanism for growing up and growing into a very uncertain future is going to be through information and education. So I think we have to try, and powers that be, if they can uh, contribute to this, I think we have to try and persuade governments to change our curriculum. I think biodiversity and climate should be a standalone subject in for every child in every school and we do have a system on um, which are called eco schools uh, we have a few eco schools in scotland but unfortunately that hasn't really developed but an eco school is actually where biodiversity is absolutely fundamental to virtually everything that they, that they do um, within their educative system so i think we have to really fight for that and i think if that's if that could be if education can be emphasized at cop as well i think that's really important because we absolutely have to to give a younger generation coping mechanisms that will only come through education and empowerment. You took some of the words out of my mouth, Jane. But I want to say something else about education, um, which I think is really important. I'm always interested in the origin of words, the etymology, where they come from. And education comes from the Latin ducari, which is to lead, and educari, educate, is to lead out. So the true meaning of education is to draw out what's already inside. But of course, education has become co-opted in our world today by the dominant worldview, and it's about stuffing in. So people literally cram before their exams. They cram in as much information as possible, which often buries what's already inside. So we need an education system that's actually totally transformed, that encourages people, children, teenagers, everybody to explore what's inside and to allow that to come out. And the sort of thing you're talking about is part of that. I also wanted to come to the other question from Sean about you know, reaching out to the people who are really deprived. And personally, if I think about the millions who are facing starvation in places like Sudan at the moment, it's totally unrealistic to expect them to be concerned directly about climate change and biodiversity loss. They're worried about where's their food and water coming from. So I think we have to do two things. We have to address those issues. And secondly, I think we have to provide a different role model because they're all on the bottom rung of the ladder at the moment on the conventional role model of more growth, more wealth, concentration and so forth. And I think the thing there is we have to consciously choose people like me who live in a wealthy country to live more simply. That's why I became vegan in 1979. I live in an eco-village where all our energy comes from our local wind turbines. I grow food in my conservatory and in my small vegetable patch. I try to minimize my demands on the planet. And we need different role models like that because that's how we can share the natural abundance of the wealth more equitably. And I think that will speak loud to people when they, they have a different role model than just greed and people driving around in luxury cars and private jets and they're struggling to eat. Yeah, just one more thing on COP. And if anybody goes to, if anybody's interested in my art and goes to my website, they'll see the elephant in the room. Now, the elephant in the room is something that I created on a vast mural on a massive wall to go on social media. And the elephant in the room for COP26, and I presume every COP, is war. Why is war never addressed? The CO2E of war and the whole military, uh, what do you call it, the military thingy complex, you know what I mean, industrial complex, it is never ever mentioned and yet it is one of the most destructive things, elements on this planet. So please, anyone who's at COP, start talking about war. We've got a few more minutes. Any more burning issues? So I see a hand at the end. Anyone at the top? Uh, okay, so I'm going to take that hand and that hand, and then we're going to close. Um, yeah, so in there we go. Uh, in considering the, the global uh, issues and looking at the, the donut economics uh, model and, and how you know, that's being adopted in many uh, local jurisdictions. I think of the, the global problem of 
um, say monocropping and uh, global trade in that, and how do we bring that back to short local food supply chains? And you know, that's just one example of you know how do you apply you know that donut economics model to the global um, stage, right? Uh, that seems like insurmountable. Uh, I'm sure Kate may have some uh, uh, light to shed on that. But to me, it seems like it's mostly you know, we need to focus on the local, right? Adopting that, having those discussions locally, and um, addressing issues locally uh, first and foremost. Thanks so much to the panel. My name is Robin from Two Ai Punami, South Island, New Zealand. We've talked a lot about um, the need for place-based collective action. So I'd like to return to the, the question of decision-making, governance structures to support the appropriate decisions for that place and community. Okay, I'm not gonna go back to every panelist. So I think we've got a couple of questions there. One is around, you know, going back to the local, one is around uh, place-based collective action through decision-makings and governance structures. So maybe a couple of you feel keen to, yeah. Tino, please, have you got a mic? Uh, I don't want to be rude with this answer, but uh, uh, be, be sure, communication is not working very well. Communication is burning the head of many kids and generations, showing us that the the only heroes is the Hollywood ones that is creating all the movies. It's amazing that I visited Africa, I visited uh, Asia, uh, all the South America, and the people see us underestimated, especially the new local leaders, and they said, don't you know, that is impossible. Of course, you think that there's only Superman is going to save the world. Bullshit, that is not true. And about the governance, the local governments use the communications in that way. Why? Because the corruption is advancing more and more in that scenario, in that arena. The people is not thinking that they can confront these uh, corrupted governments. And also, it's worse. Around the world, it's amazing. The people is looking for easy, easy solutions, and they are calling reforestation to plant eucalyptus and pinus trees. It's amazing, in Africa they are planting eucalyptus. All South America is covered in eucalyptus. What is destroying all the nature? It's eucalyptus trees because they suck the, the water. One single tree takes six liters of water daily. And when the eucalyptus are beautiful, when they burn, you saw Australia, you are seeing Chile, you are seeing Florida, nice big fires, you know? For that reason, is the, the decision makers, sometimes they are playing with us. And of course, environmental education or yes, education is so important if we use very well the communications. I had been doing a lot of environmental education, but you know, when we try to change the curricula in all these countries, they don't want. They don't want. They are still in South America, we are learning ecology with elephants and rhinos and, jagu uh, and lions. And when you live to the Amazonia, no rhinos, no elephants, no lions. This is all reality. And the other thing, please, Receive this message. Every time when I speak loudness, all the people come to me and say, good for you. Sorry? <laughs> I mean, saving the planet not for me. It's for all of us. Imagine, only with that single thing, we are passing the responsibility to others. Let's be part of the solution all together. Everybody has to do the best performance to protect this single, single planet. Thank you so much. Can I add something? Yeah, just uh, don't want to end on, on a bad note on that, um, but the hypocrisy is, is blatant. I mean, just yesterday I was flying, uh, taking a train into here, 
And I was sitting next to a guy, and you know how it goes. There's a screen, and you're there, you don't have anything to do, and you start looking, and you don't want to look. And you <laughs> Long story short, he was working on Excel, and we started talking at some point, basically brokering uh, um, series for Netflix, Amazon Prime, and so on. And I've essentially, together with Tino, we became fundraisers overnight because we had a huge vision and we thought there is somewhere we need to start. I think that's a common challenge. And, you know, we grew this, this, this Andean program from a very generous $10,000 donation into a multi-million program over years with very hard work. And I couldn't believe that in six weeks of rental time, just serious, probably some of them are good, some of them, there was almost $800 million at the bottom of entertainment fee that you would then think out millions of millions of people watching. Right? So when you come back to this um, education, to this inspiration, I think we have a lot of work there to do. I feel a lot of people are so empty by, by, by the system we have created that with very practical acts, which includes celebration, which includes rituals, which includes going out to nature, there's a lot of power in that. So I would add to the war argument, the entertainment argument, quite a lot. It is, and there's Euroleague Euro going on right now, great, right? But it is blatant what sort of money, compared to what it would cost to restore nature, is actually out there. So it's not an economic argument in that sense. Money, there's, that's probably the, the thing that is most available in the world right now. We have to really do something collectively to get that money into the right places. And that's something that there's a positive argument, but there's a lot of activism behind it. We have to demand, uh, uh, demand those changes. So I've been given the dreaded uh, stop sign and I, I wanted to give a last chance to colleagues up here on the stage for some final words or a final word. So I think there's this call for action that's coming both online and in the room. Um, would love to hear your 30 second pitch for a really strong action point that you think either you, your organization or other people in the room could take from here. Um, maybe we can go in reverse order if people are happy for us to do that. So if we're happy to start here and then we'll go back down and then we'll wrap up. Okay, just waiting for, is this on? Okay, um, my suggested action point is uh, to each person, what's your wildest dream? If there were no obstacles, no problems, no challenges in the world, what would you do with your life? What does your heart tell you? Because that's exactly what you should be doing. It may seem impossible, it may seem ridiculous, but if it's in your heart, it's there for a reason and a purpose, and it is your gift to the world. So find that gift if you don't already know what it is, and take the first step to manifesting it. Just a very little action, when any of you go out walking in nature, or underneath a tree, or wherever, Start seeing, start looking in different ways in order to see. Don't take in the big picture or the big vistas or whatever. Go for the absolute tiny little detail. And if you find, let's say, sadly, a dead butterfly or, a li or even a live butterfly, try to look into the eye of the butterfly. It does something very intimate and it does something very special with your connection with nature. I'm going to bring it back to the mission that I've dedicated my life to, which is Ecoside Law. And I'm going to invite everybody to talk about Ecoside in their networks. If you interact with policy, bring it in there. If you interact with civil society or in public you know, articles or events, bring it in there. Um, and in your own sector, you know, where does your sector meet? What's your, what's your yearly conference? What's your podcast or your newsletter? And how do we include that in the conversation? Because the more it gets talked about, the faster it moves. And it's very exciting. So please join in. Thank you. Thank you. 
I would say be bold, be ambitious, and just do it. And it might start with a small piece of land. It might start with a jar of honey. Whatever it starts with, it it can get bigger or have infinitely more impact that you can ever imagine. So it might seem hard or how do you start, but just do it. Yeah, just adding to that, um, there's literally no place on earth that does need to be restored at this point. Right? So wherever, in the garden, in the city, somewhere half across the world, it doesn't really matter, we should really get started. And I think for kids specifically, especially, there is such a huge opportunity to dedicate, to discover, explore, dedicate, and become entrepreneurs in that sense to actually restore nature. And that process, there is a lot of beauty and a lot of power for the generations ahead. Thank you for giving me this opportunity on closing this session. <laughs> this is high responsibility. For me, every person who takes their life or kills some, some life is against us. Who is protecting the life? Even the governments who created laws in favor of the deforestation or just illegal mining also is confronting us. For that reason, I invite to that people to move to Jupiter or to Mars <laughs> to continue killing and destroying whatever they want, you know, because they don't deserve it to be here. We must to continue working hard. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. I invite you to take action. Some people in the morning, they remind that their pets, their kids, everything. Think on them twice or much better, thinking what we are going to leave to them. I hope my kids and my grand. Uh, kids are going to enjoy somewhere the mountains, the Amazon, the creatures, or even better, sing, dance, and drink with the local communities. It's the best thing that I enjoy too much. <laughs> really. Brilliant. Thank you so much. How can I restore relationship? How can you restore relationship? How can I restore relationship? I leave here, I think with the image of the bridge from the previous session, I think we talked a lot about connection, right? And connecting with ourselves, connecting with others. Um, for those of us who were here last night, the beautiful singing of Sam Lee, he sang about meeting in a pleasant place. So we're also talking about connection and meeting, and we're talking about relationships. And we're talking about relationship at those three levels, right? And I think they're all interconnected. So it's the relationship with nature. And we heard all about that with direct examples here. It's relationship with community and with the land, and it's relationship with ourselves. And of course, those three mutually reinforce one another as well. So I take that away, and I take away, I think, the power of imagination. I think it's wonderful to be with artists, activists, and those who are thinking beyond our conformist boxes that we all live in as we learned today. Uh, and of course, the imagination, art and culture has that incredible capacity for us to see beyond that, uh, imagine a future that is meaningful for all of us. So thank you to the artists, thank you to the activists, thank you to the practitioners. It's been an incredible session. And thank you for talking about love as well, which I think is what I'm sort of taking away in my heart and is a source of action for me as well. So thank you to all of you. Wow, um, <clears throat> what a day. Um, how are you all feeling? 
Yeah? Good. Still got energy? Yes. Yeah? Final push? So, um, I, want to, I want you to think for a minute. I'm hoping you, know, you are, the, you, know, you are the, the ones who have chosen to stay here or able to stay here to the end. And in a few short minutes, we're going to be going out to the fire. Okay. The fire bowl is back. Uh, so that flame that has been burning these three days will turn back into the bigger fire bowl. And I want you to all think of one commitment you are taking from this conference, something you're going to carry in your heart that you are going to take back with you wherever you go. Something that you can then look at yourself in the mirror and know that this was real. What happened here today, these last three days was real. People talking of love, people talking of relationship, reciprocity, okay? So just take one minute, just think, what are you gonna take to the fire? Because the fire is there as it has been for our ancestors for generation after generation after generation. So what is the commitment you will carry to the fire? when we walk out together in a few short minutes. And it will have something to do with what you heard from Mac this morning, what you just heard from Alan now, of what is that deepest dream? What is it that you love the most? And it'll be a beginning of that. And I encourage you to tend that, also like you tend a flame, for that to keep growing over the weeks and months and years ahead, because it will feed you, because it's feeding your inner journey for you to then manifest that in the world, in the extraordinary work you're already doing, so that together we will be braver to talk about these things in circles with finance people, with business people, with ministers, uh, with communities, with those who have little, with those who have far too much, because we need to weave it into all of these conversations. So I'm not going to try and summarize the day, but I am going to leave you with three R's. <laughs> Maybe somebody can weave together the T's and the P's, and, but the three R's are actually the three R's of why we've set up Astara. And Astara is launching in, no, in, in, at, this, at this conference. It's its first manifestation here, it's emerging. I don't know yet what it will become, but the three R's that have been themes that have run through today are to reconnect to each other, to yourself, to that inner flame, and to Mother Earth. And the many ways that we can do that, that we've had some experience of these last few days, or Jane's invitation to look at the eyes of a butterfly or the leaf you may have been presented with when you came into the conference. So to reconnect, to remember, to remember our kinship, which came up again throughout the day. And as Harvey said in his final words about identity fusion, how we come together and how we remember we are all connected because from that place, we really can reimagine the future. And that's the third R. So to reconnect, to remember, and to reimagine. And we need to do that together by holding hands and reaching across and building bridges to traditional ecological knowledge still held by our indigenous brothers and sisters, to the science community that, that is so strong in this town and so many towns and cities around the world to weave these together. But the artists, the musicians, that's why we had that beautiful performance last night and why we invited in a Greek choir to again to inspire because reimagining requires all of those skills, the weaving together of the heart and the head and the hands. So that's what it's that's what, for me, this is about. That's how we take 
our nature agenda to the next level. And I hope so much of today has enriched and, and brought you all into that deeper space as well. I've been deeply touched. I've been, I think, most touched by the reaction I know uh, some of you have shared with me in the breaks. And, uh, and so uh, I, I would thank you for holding the space and being vulnerable to hear, to listen deeply to what was being said. And I want to finish uh, my words uh, with just two last things. One, again, from, my, uh, from the bottom of my heart to thank you, Natalie, for putting all of this on. And I know you're going to come up and do many thank yous, but you have had the vision for this conference, for the initiative, and you've also been brave enough to allow some of this more edge thinking to be woven directly into this, and you've taken many risks yourself, and I really want this room to applaud your vision and your courage. And I want to thank, there's many people to thank, but I just want to thank all of the fire keepers who have come, who have been woven together because of Max's vision for Embercombe and have all been touched by Embercombe in some way, but they have been here volunteering their time. And I just honor and salute you for all you have done to hold this conference space in a very different way. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. And with that, it's my great honor to hand across to the extraordinary <laughs> Natalie Seddon. <laughs> I asked at the beginning, I asked, uh, invited intention and attention. And I really feel like there was a great deal of both. So thank you for really engaging with this, with this journey. Um, for some reason, I thought that I'd be able to, I think I've got wrap up, haven't I, in the program. I'm going to wrap up what we've tried to, 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 um, to, to do here. And, if, and of course, that's not, that's not possible. It's been so expansive and so inclusive. And it's going to take quite some time, I think, for the ideas, for the learnings, for the wisdom, for it all to settle into something. Um, so let's give ourselves time. <laughs> Uh, to process what's happened here because it feels like there's been new constellations of people and of ideas and new weavings uh, new fabric um, that that will help make us resilient and give us courage so this is where we've got to so far with our river map <laughs> to Belen and beyond our river map to a nature-based economy our river map to the present moment um, but we've left lots of space here uh, space for, for the new things to emerge that we might want to communicate. And it's our plan to take this, travel with this. We can roll up this beautiful mural. Thank you, Cecile and, and Lisa, for creating this, and to Rafi for creating this beautiful thing. Uh, those of you going to Cali in Colombia, the CBD COP, those of you going to Belen, you'll see, you'll see it there. <laughs> um, so let's just sit with all the learnings we've had. I'm so humbled by all the wisdom you've brought. Today has is, is, is been extraordinary. I felt like we could listen to all speakers for so much longer than we were able to hold space for them. But I'm so glad we held space for them all. Um, and so instead of trying to wrap up and <laughs> instead of trying to present a road map to or river map to Belém, I'm, I'm just going to tell a story, um, a personal story. Um, it's about time. And I think my own relationship with time and wrapped up in that, my relationship with nature and how I think about and communicate about nature. I had a, a beautiful moment this morning before everything started. Um, I was with Geraldine and we were found ourselves next to a 4.5 billion year old meteorite. It's just out there. If you haven't had an opportunity to, to visit this meteorite, then I, I urge you to do so. And we lay out, laid our hands on this incredibly old meteorite. And then we visited the other 
pieces of earth, a 1.5 billion year old piece of quartz. And Geraldine shared with me a beautiful story about a dream she had about the quartz. And I was thinking about time and what happened to time when Sam Lee was singing songs of these lands beneath an iguanodon. Um, and just felt the time stretch out there and reflecting on this theme that has come through all three days actually um, about how much we need to slow down in order to accelerate the transformation that we need. We need to take time, we need ceremony, we need to sit in circle, we need to give ourselves permission to take more time over the decisions that we make. Um, I really felt that very strongly. My love of nature, I'm barefoot in the night garden, sniffing flowers as a child. <laughs> My love of nature was very, very deep when I was little, and it, but it took me into biology, and events into ecology, and curiosity, scientific curiosity for diversity, the diversity of life and how it came to be. And that took me to the rainforests of the world, you know, and I found uh, going into those forests at that time felt like going home. So I felt at home in the rainforests, but didn't felt feel ho at home in my own home where I was born. But I felt at home in the rainforests, and I was an evolutionary biologist, and I was used to thinking about very, very long periods of time and evolutionary time, deep time. And, you know, human beings back then to me were just another species that was going to go extinct just like all the other species, because that's what evolution was about. And that was beautiful for me then, and I was happy with that. But then what that traveling did is it connected me, all those travels around the world and often interacting with beautiful local communities and indigenous peoples, it made me love people more, made me love humanity, it made me love the human project and having children, of course, made me love the human project even more and made me care very much about much shorter time frames, made me care very much about what's happening in the next five, 10 years, the next 20 years, where we're gonna be by the end of the century. And of course then, moving into climate change, moving into trying to work on the problems at the nexus of climate change and biodiversity loss and equity. Um, but it's that journey and all that traveling has made, has brought me back home to my own home and to these lands and one of the most beautiful and wonderful things that's happened over the last two or three years since the pandemic. Um, really, um, has really connected me with these beautiful, beautiful lands. And I care very much about this as my home. And this week, my home has, has been an extraordinary place. <laughs> I returned from, you know, from a, I had a wonderful dinner with the wonderful sponsors and other fabulous people that helped made this conference possible. And it was a riotous dinner. We were disturbing everybody in the restaurant. There was so much joy <laughs> um, there. And, and that was wonderful. And I'd sort of forgotten, actually, this other beautiful thing that was going on at my own house, this extraordinary process where we've brought the fire. The fire has, has been in my home in Whiteham in the garden. And I would get back in the evening to find these beautiful fire keepers tending the fire in my garden, sitting with them in the evening and sitting with them in my dressing gown, the cup of tea in the morning, <laughs> and, and giving myself permission to um, have a little ceremony, a ritual, a, a pause, a time to reflect on what all this meant, something that I very rarely do. And many of us working in this sector very rarely give ourselves permission to take time. And I was thinking this is very special, but these sorts of ceremony, and this echoes what um, Lila June said earlier, it's like we can have, we must bring little rituals into our lives every day. Make the baths for the bees and the birds and start with that inner work and, and work with oneself. Um, so, and sitting with the fire um, and trying to sort of bring together a bit of the so. <laughs> A kaleidoscope of thoughts I have about this week, but I have three C's rather than three R's. I know, I know. Have we had three C's yet? We might have done actually. Um, and the, you know, the three C's are ceremony, courage, and community. So the ceremony, the, the ritual, the time out, the time, taking time to speed up taking time to look back in order that we go forward. I love that that's, that theme that has come through all three days. Um, the courage to be bold, to hold on to our vision of a flourishing future. I think many, we are vision, we need to hold that vision. If we don't hold a vision of a, a beautiful flourishing future, 
that vision, you know, that, that reality won't manifest. So we need to do that. And I feel that there's been a lot of courage being built here. Some, another courage to be whole and to hold a vision of these holistic solutions, nature-based solutions as holistic solutions, working with nature as part of nature. Be courageous to reframe nature not as something in service as people, but of people and the economy in service of the web of life and to hold that vision even in challenging conversations hold on to that so courage to do that courage to do the work and community i mean i feel that one of the things i said i hoped at the very least we might emerge with a sense of community a sense of solidarity and a sense of agency and i feel that there's just a wonderful community the nature community the nature-based community is vibrant and diverse and we're each doing things slightly differently, and that diversity is what gives us strength. So I hope we can carry on building this community um, and moving on from this. And we will be in touch with you all in different ways and sharing all sorts of beautiful things that have emerged, artistic and scientific things, new collaborations and so on that have been building during this week. We will, um, we will hold on. We have got something very special here, I think. And many people have come up to me with so much beautiful comments about the energy here and the positivity and the hope that we've, we've, we're creating together and the determination to do the hard work that lies ahead. So thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. Um, so, much, so, much, <laughs> so much happened to make this possible and I've got the most extraordinary team who've worked so hard to make this happen, to make the main, the main conference program happen and all the things that's involved there, but also to try and um, respect this idea of holding a conference within a ceremony and all the practicalities and the wizardry and the wonder that, that had to come together to make that happen. So I want to start, I just do need to say thank you. Um, I want to thank the museum <laughs> for letting us do have this incredible meeting in this incredible building with all its history and what that means. So thank you very much, museum. I feel that um, being able to have a ceremony, being able to have a fire outside this building was a very beautiful, remarkable thing that they enabled. So I wanted to thank the museum for that and the opportunity. Thanking the sponsors, of course, for making, making things possible, making it possible for, to us to bring you all here, to bring many of you here from very far-flung places across the planet. Without the support of the sponsors, that wouldn't have been possible. So thank you for that. Um, and Justin, thank you. Thank you for the, the, the energy and the wisdom and the journey that we have begun. Um, so I'd like to bring onto the stage my amazing, the amazing Nature Based Solutions team as well as the incredible Ostara Firekeepers team. I haven't, we haven't got time now to thank them all individually, but they all deserve to be thanked individually. We will have a fire, we will continue the fire at my house this evening and we'll, we will we will um, exchange gifts then. Um, but I do want to, to thank Leela for her overall organization, for being a rock of organization and calm. I do hope she's in the building or she's probably organizing something. There she is. There she is. Yeah, so please, please do, do come onto the stage, Leela, thank you. And many of you will have been in touch with Leela. She's organized so much of the really hard, the hard stuff, the hard details, um, and also grounding the likes of me and Justin. We, we do need grounding because we get very carried away. Um, so thank you, Leela, and Audrey too. Thank you so much for all of your work and support. Please come to the stage. Again. Audrey put extraordinary amount into this conference, just especially the content of all that, you know, making sure that these sessions work smoothly, you know, that the content sang. So thank you so much for that. And also holding the reins of my ridiculous diary and, and telling me <laughs> where I needed to be and when, and that's not an easy job. So thank you so much. And Kerry, are you here, Kerry? I hope so. Kerry, with all her extraordinary work with the communications. <laughs> Incredible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kerry. All the 
all the communications involved with with this conference you can imagine all the moving parts and the spinning plates and the and again grounding so I, i'm very grateful to everybody in my team perhaps these three in particular because it has been there and they've been working night and day for many months it seems probably seems like an eternity to you three doesn't it but we're all i think all of us extremely happy with the way things have gone but also wanted to very much thank becca and dan from the astara team <laughs> Yeah. Again, thank you so much, particularly, particularly for making making you know, the ceremonial and cultural aspects of this, organising all of that. Um, you've been incredible, and I feel like we've all worked together as a beautiful team. Um, but I also want to thank JP. For all, for all the remarkable, beautiful things, for much wizardry and craftsmanship and carpentry and uh, ash from the thousand sacred fires and this beautiful creation and many, many, many other things as well. Um, and for staying very calm <laughs> and being very supportive and there for me. So thank you, JP. I would like to thank you all individually, but I think I'll just invite you all up to the stage now, please, the rest of the teams. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah as you can see <laughs> as you can see what well, uh, an extraordinary team there are many beautiful souls beautiful humans on this stage vision holders and weavers of knowledge um, artists and scientists and practitioners and carpenters and, and all sorts of well, wonderful, wonderful people um, and very diverse and as you are in the audience as well. So I have run out of words completely. Um, so let's, let's move on now outside. We're going to go outside slowly. First of all, the fire keepers are going to go outside. That's right. I'm just telepathically communicating with Justin right now because we're going to all go outside now. And I do hope you have time to join us. So we're going to go back around the fire um, where some words will be said, a poem will be read, um, and we will officially close the conference, hopefully with you all in ceremony. So thank you again, wonderful audience, and thank you, fabulous team. And one more thank you to the extraordinary film shed at the back. Who, <laughs> it's it's not an accident that this has been communicated to a, to our wonderful online audience. And also thank you to the online audience um, because they have been extremely engaged as well. Um, so thank you, thank you all of that community online and Steve for and his assistant Chris for enabling it all. Okay. Thank you.